Amen. What a great day. Um, I, I do want you to know that I am uh, hopefully shortening my sermon a little bit based on time. Um, we'll see how that works for us. Hey, here at Crossroads Church, we just kind of walk through Scripture together, and so uh, we let the Bible just be the Bible. Um, I, I'm not a creative, so I don't add my creativity to it, which is why we do it this way. We just pick a, a portion of Scripture, and we just walk through that portion of Scripture together. We're in 1 Corinthians, which is a letter in the New Testament that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. So what happened is a group of people had come to Ephesus where Paul was ministering Paul had started the church in Corinth and then left it in charge uh, with some different leaders in charge. And he was planting a church elsewhere. He was in Ephesus. They come to Ephesus. They give him a report as to the things that are happening. And then they brought a letter where they were asking him some questions from the church and, and anticipating some sort of a response. This letter was that response. And so he starts off with some corrective measures like, hey, I was told this about y'all, and y'all need to stop that. you got to cut that out. Don't do that. And so he, he kind of walks us through some things where he's giving us some examples of what real Christianity looks like and the expectations that the apostles had of the churches and the Christ followers at the time. And then he, he gets into a little transition here in chapter 7, we're going to see, where... Um, where he begins answering some of the questions that they had asked. Can I just, before we read scripture together, can I just point out that God is a big enough God for you to have some questions? Can I also point out that there is no anticipation in scripture that we have or will ever have all of the answers? Which is why we can ask some questions. And what we're going to discover is that the questions being asked are awkward and very real. And so I want us to acknowledge the awkwardness up front. Here's your, here's your I'm prepping you. Happy baptism day. Listen, it's just the way the scriptures work, right? We don't dodge hard topics. We don't, we don't preach around certain things. If the Bible says it, we're going to read it and talk about it. And so this is just where we are. Would you stand with me? We're going to read one verse of Scripture today, reaffirm the awkwardness of that Scripture, and then we'll talk about how it applies to our lives today, okay? So read this with me. It's the first verse of chapter 7. It says, Now for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. Happy Baptism Day. That's all we're reading together. You guys can sit down. Yeah. I love it. So he goes ahead and addresses some things that he wanted them to know, like stop arguing with each other. This is, this is the things, that you, how you should treat each other in relationships. And, and then he says, listen, now, now let me start addressing the things that you asked me about. And, and here's, here's what we have. Um, this was... This was the teaching from the church in Corinth. Notice that it's in quotes. Most of the scripture portages, portages is not a word. It's a com combination of portions and passages. Most of the scriptures, uh, the different versions and translations will have this in quotes because it's believed that this is the matter they wrote about. Now for the matter you wrote about, boom. And then he's telling him what it is. So he's referencing this. So they, they would have understood, okay, good. Now we're going to talk about this because we have a question about that. Now they have a, um, um, they're asking questions about it. They've developed a teaching. This was their strategy for reaching the felt needs of their community. And they were looking for his seal of approval on their strategy. And so Paul's going to address some things, but, but what he's doing is he's addressing their strategy for how they can engage their community, which was highly promiscuous. So they've developed a strategy, and he's, he's addressing that. And in his addressing of that, what we'll see is that he actually gives us some principles of marriage. So their topic is, okay, what do we do about all the promiscuity? 
And Paul's response to that is, we need to have a proper view of marriage. If people would hold a proper view of their spouse, if they would hold a proper view of marriage, then that by nature will fix the promiscuity. And so he's addressing this. Listen, you asked me about this. I'm going to give you some answers. Here's here's what you're looking for. I know you want my seal of approval in the way that you're teaching things, but let's make sure that we've thought through everything in the way that we're teaching so that we don't just give a half teaching. Has anyone ever had a half teaching? Like, has that ever happened in church? Where you're told, don't do that, but you're not ever told, do this instead. Or this is how you don't do that, right? So here's what we have an example of. In Corinth, this was their teaching. So people are, are getting saved. And, and remember, there was a, a temple of Aphrodite, three temples in that town. The first multi site church was the temple of Aphrodite in Corinth. 1,000 temple prostitutes, those are just the females, and so this was a very promiscuous community. And so they're trying to develop, what, how do we disciple people? What do we tell people? When they get saved, when they come into our church, what do we tell them? And this was their rule. It's good for a man to not have sexual relations with a woman. That was their rule. Okay, well, I'd like to start a family These things seem incompatible. So Paul's saying, listen, yes, we're going to have a complete conversation. We want to make sure that we've started everything, that we've thought about everything, that we're communicating in a complete way, and his solution to the promiscuity is a proper view of marriage. And so now that we kind of have an idea of what is being communicated, I'm going to continue to read uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I'm going to read um, through verse 9. So he says, Now for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man to not have sexual relations with a woman. Verse 2, But since sexual immorality is occurring... Each man should have sexual relations with his own wife, and each woman with her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. Do not deprive each other, except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer." Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all of you were as I am. That means single. But each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Now to the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So Paul's the same guy that says, hey, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I know what it is to have food. I know what it is to starve. I know what it is to be well-clothed and warm. I know what it is to be uh, not well-clothed and very cold. Like he, he knows all of these things, right? I just want to point some things out. He's not speaking on this topic one-sidedly. Paul was a Pharisee. He tells us that uh, in various scriptures where we see that he was a member of the Pharisees. To be a member of the Pharisees, there were certain things that you had to have, that you had to do. Marriage was one of them. So in order for him to be a Pharisee, he had to have a wife. Now, it is not ever told us in scripture what happened to his wife, what is believed, and what has been passed down through um, lore, Jewish and Christian, is that when he converted to Christianity, his wife left him. So he understands what it is to be married, and he understands what it is to no longer be married. And now he viewed, hey, listen, if if she's going to leave me because of my faith, I'm going to let her go, and I'm going to devote my whole time and focus to the church. And so this was his approach. So he's not speaking blindly, right? One of my biggest struggles in ministry is when I graduate Bible college at the ripe, experienced age of 22. I start working in a church as a youth pastor, which in some people's minds, they hear that and they think youth expert And within the first several weeks, I've got parents sitting in my office saying, I don't know how to parent this kid. What do you think? 
bro, I don't even have kids. I don't have a wife. I don't even really like your kid. If they wanted to go to that Baptist youth group, I would be down. Like, I don't know the answers. I'm kidding. Some of them watch us online. You know the ones I'm talking about. Again, kidding. It was hard, right, because people are coming to you, looking to you for advice. And I, my, honest, my honest approach to this is I don't know. I can speak in conjecture. I can hypothesize. But I've never been a parent. I've never been a dad. I've never been a husband. I don't know the answers that you're seeking. And that we can read that into Paul, right, when he's saying, hey, listen, if you're going to be married, be married this way. I wish you weren't married. I wish you're single like me. It's like, okay. I mean, parents. You know the ones that come to you and say, oh, my child will never do that. I bet they won't. But this is not what's happening. This is not Paul, single man, always been a single man, never been married, saying, I think you should be married this way. This is not what's happening. He has been married. He has experienced that. The loss of his marriage was due to the gospel of Jesus Christ, and now he's devoted to how can I maintain ministry? How do I understand and help other people to understand what I went through? I'm speaking from experience. This is where everything went awry for me. It went awry because I said, Jesus is my Savior, and she said, not in this house. And so he, he's, he's speaking from experience. He's giving us these lessons that we can learn, this proper view that we can have of marriage, and he's teaching us things that will help us as we, as we talked about several weeks ago, as we engage community around us. Their society in Corinth was not dissimilar from our society today. There was a level of freedom. There was a level of you do what you want. There was a level of promiscuity that was extremely high in that community. And it's just like that in our community today. And so we can take these same principles, these same views of marriage. If we can teach our single people, our married people, our kids, if we can teach them these proper views of marriage, it will help them steer them away from the promiscuity and the whatever it is from our society and help dedicate them both to the Lord and to the future that he has for their lives. Here's the first thing that we see in Scripture First instruction that he gives us as he tries to uphold for us a proper view of marriage. View your spouse as someone to serve. This is what he's really wanting us to understand. View your spouse as someone to serve. I'm going to read the, again the first four verses. Now for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, but since sexual immorality is occurring, can we say that about our, our day and age? I mean, since it's happening, here's the fix. Each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body but yields it to her husband in the same way the husband does not have authority over his own body but yields it to his wife. Um, there is, I, I'm, I'm not going to get into it both for time and because there's young people in the room. There is a, a phrase in the Greek, a word in the Greek, that when we translate it as sexual relations, that's the PG version of what's being communicated. So the, the heart behind the very first statement, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, the, the heart behind that is that that is very one-sided. The principle in our society that would be most in keeping with this in Scripture is do what makes you feel good. It's selfish. It's self-serving. It's what you want with no thought given to what they want. And then here he's, he's sort of exposing that level of selfishness by the word choice that he uses when he's talking about marriage. He says, the husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife. 
Likewise, the wife to her husband. That word duty, it literally in the Greek, it literally means a debt to be fulfilled and repaid. So the contrast here is, are you acting selfishly? Or do you view your spouse as someone to whom you owe a debt that must be repaid? If that's your view of things, then you are serving your spouse, not serving yourself. And so this is the, I don't know another word, juxtaposition of the two. The the compare and contrast. There we go. This is the compare and contrast between the two. One, serving yourself. The other, serving your spouse. Paul wants us to view our spouse as someone to serve. Many people have, have applied Ecclesiastes 4.12 to a marriage. I think this is a scripture that helps us understand how we maintain this mindset of my spouse as someone to serve. So let's read this. It says, Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. It says two can defend themselves. Two have power. So when, when society says this, when the temptation is this, two can defend against that. The, the strand of three, what is even better than marriage is when you invite Jesus into your marriage and now it's not just you two, you two against the world, it's you two and Jesus against the world. So what Paul is saying is it's good to be devoted to your spouse and to view them as someone to serve. It's even better to be devoted to God and from your devotion to God, be devoted to your spouse and to God and view serving them as a means by which you serve God. So this is what Paul wants us to know. View your spouse as someone to serve. Here's the second thing. View your spouse as a partner. View your spouse as a partner. In verse 5, he says this, Do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent, that's the key word there, and for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. The words mutual consent in the Greek mean an agreed upon plan. So this isn't one person making all the decisions. This isn't one person left without a voice. This isn't one person being the dominant and expecting the other person to be uh, the, the weaker. This is not this. This is an agreed upon plan that we have an agreed upon plan and we can agree upon this plan because we are partners in life. And this is what, this is what Paul this is his expectation, is that we view our spouse as a partner. That we, we, if you're not married, we find someone with whom we can partner. And if we are dating and thinking about marriage, if you can't partner with that person, that's not the person for you. It's that important. If that person doesn't view you as a, pa- as a partner, that person needs to get packing. We're not, the Bible doesn't teach us this star-crossed lovers. You have a soulmate. And you can search through 10,000 worlds and 1,000 lifetimes to find your soulmate. That's weird. And it's not biblical, right? We make choices, and the choices that we make are choices that God leads us to make. And then we put in the hard work to make those choices work. And if you can't view your whoever you're dating as a partner, or if they don't view you as a partner, it's time to move on down the road. Because there's plenty of people out there that God can bring into your life that you can help and that can help you. This is how God designed the relationship to function. We read about it in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Helper suitable in the Hebrew could be translated as one who helps, who is the other side of. 
Like you've heard people jokingly say, where's your better half? Biblical. Because this word for helper means the other side of. So when you find a spouse, when you are committed to that spouse, that is the other side of you. You are the other side of them. You, you work in concert. My right side can't say, I'm going to do this and leave my left side behind. We're one. The one of me does whatever it is. And that's the analogy in Scripture. The two become one. And the Bible says, this is God's word, I will make the other side to help him. We view our spouse as a partner. Here's the third thing. We view your spouse as a gift. View your spouse as a gift. Let's read verses 7 through 9 back in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. He says, I wish that all of you were as I am. That's single. But each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Now to the unmarried and the widows, I say this, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So Paul's gift was a crazy high amount of self-control. That was his gift. And we know people that are that way, right? Right? You talk to them about marriage, and they're like, "Mm, hard pass. I'm good. And they have this level of self-control about them that they really are okay in that. They're not not living in gross sin. They're 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 not rejecting the idea of marriage because they'd rather have their alternate reality of sin. Like, they love Jesus well. They're created in his image. They serve. They they love. They lead. They're just okay. They have this gift of self-control like Paul did. And he says, listen, if you can do that, do that. But some of y'all, it's not your gift. You don't have that self-control. You need a spouse. I know because I've been a teenager in church before. There are students, junior high and high school, that right now are saying, God, don't give me that gift. I don't want to be the just good by myself. If you're praying that, it's probably not your gift, man. It's just not, right? Let's just call it what it is. You need to be on the road to figuring out, okay, who, how do I date? How do I date well? I'm looking for a, a wife, looking for a husband. Like, what, what does this look like? His gift was self-control. That's not your gift. You need a spouse. And this is what he says. Your spouse is your gift. He says, it's good if you can be like me, but if you can't, it's because everyone's got their own gift. This is my gift. If it's not your gift, you have a gift. What's your gift? Your spouse is your gift. It's God's gift to you. And you view your spouse as your gift. What he's doing is he's echoing the wisest man to ever walk on the face of the planet, Brock Carlin, no, Solomon, King Solomon, kidding. Not one amen. That hurts my feelings. <laughs> kidding. He's echoing the thoughts and the principles of King Solomon in Proverbs 18, that says this, a man's greatest treasure is his wife. She is a gift from the Lord. He would have known this. The women are the ones that should have said amen. I should have had amens from both of them right there. There we go. You view your wife as a, as a gift. You view your husband as a gift. This is what God wants from us. And when we view our spouse as the gift from the Lord, then, then we are much less likely to act in ways that will cause them pain and that will cause us hardship. So what if you're not married? How does this passage apply to you? Because it does. I would say the application of this passage to the unmarried is an additional application to all the married folk. I think it's the same application. 
In Ephesians, Paul gives husbands and wives some instructions on how to live. In fact, it's the, it's the most popular passage of Scripture that talks about husbands do this, wives do this. When you're looking at what is a biblical marriage, what is a biblical relationship, that's the passage where everyone goes. And he gives all of these instructions to the husbands, to the wives. And then he ends all of that by saying this. This is a profound mystery, but I'm actually talking about Christ in the church. Like he wasn't even talking about husbands and wives. And if you're like, nah, I don't know that that makes sense. That's why he calls it a profound mystery. We as the church are the bride of Christ. And the view that we have is the view that Christ has of us. And the view that we should have of him. Why should we view our spouses this way? Well, because we view Christ as someone to serve. We view Christ as someone with whom we get to partner. Like you know that, you know God can do whatever he wants, that he don't need you. But he uses us for his purposes, and what a joy that is. We view Christ as someone with whom we get to partner. We view Christ as a gift. He's given us a gift, a gift of grace, a gift of mercy, a gift of love, a gift of freedom. We don't have to be shackled by the bondage of sin. That we can live and walk in freedom together with each other. This is a gift that he has given us because he is a gift. Here's how the Bible says it. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Jesus is our gift. And because of that, we have a proper view of our spouse. When we're serving Jesus, we can serve our spouse by serving Jesus. And we can serve Jesus by serving our spouse. Will you stand with me? I'm going to close the service in prayer. If you came just for the baptisms, my apologies for where we are in Scripture. Amen. Will you pray with me? Jesus, thank you for your goodness, God, that, that you're a God that is big enough for us to ask hard questions, that, that we can talk about real things, that we don't have to dossie anything up, that we don't have to pretend that, that there's not real issues out there in the world, but God, that we can look at the world and the things that are happening and we can have a genuine question of how do we engage that in a proper and right way. And God, we can ask these questions, we can see the instructions that you have for us in your word. God, I pray, I pray for all the married people that you would help us to have a proper view of our spouse. I pray for all the single people, God, if their gift is not to be single, if their gift is a spouse, and that may be quick, that may be long time coming, but God, whatever it is, I pray that you would prepare their hearts for their spouse as you prepare the hearts of their spouse for them. God, we... We just want to serve you in the best way that we can. And so I pray that you would help us shape the view that we have and then help us. In Jesus' beautiful name, amen.